Hello, Laverne here, and thank you for joining me. May this video be a blessing to you, and may it honor and glorify God and His Kingdom. This video is in response to one posted by the Atheist No Plum 99, and I hope you will take the time to pause my video and go to the link provided and watch his video. I ask that you do this, not just because I think it's something you should do in order you can understand the points I'm bringing up, but also because he does bring up some valid points that I think you should hear from him himself. I have a lot of respect for No Plum, and it's because when he does make a video, and even though he's an atheist, he goes out of his way to make sure he's not taking scripture out of context. I believe he's one of the few atheists on YouTube who does this. Most atheists, people such as Thunderfoot uh, uh, and others like him, purposely and knowingly take scripture out of context when they make a video. But that's not the case with Noplum. He actually asks questions that Christians should be able to answer, and yet most can't. He asks some very tough questions and uh, brings up some difficult uh, but uh, valid points. So, as a Christian, I do suggest that you watch the video that I'm responding to. Now, the gist of this video is that uh, the Holocaust, when we look at it from a scriptural point of view, actually, uh, in his case, he's describing it more as a biblical point of view, for he refers only to the Bible. And I will be, uh, in this video, referring to uh, some writings that fall outside of the Bible. But according to him, and according to most people who are Bible believers, the Holocaust actually does line up with some of the things we've seen in the Old Testament. For example, uh, the nation of Israel being taken over, being attacked, destroyed, and taken over by the Babylonians, and then the Israelites being exiled to Babylon. And we know that this was done because they turned their backs on God. So we do have cases, examples in Scripture where this kind of thing happens. Well, if this was true back in that day, why then would the same not apply to what happened with the Jews uh, during World War II and the Holocaust? Well, the answer is it's, it's actually pretty difficult to say that God's hand had nothing to do with the Holocaust. We would be hypocrites as Christians to say, well, no, that had nothing to do with God. God is all good. God would never allow that to happen. It was simply the case of people turning their backs on God and God allowing free will. And, and that's what happened. But that's not the case as it's described in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we have many examples of how God is the one who built up uh, non-believers, Gentiles, and had them come against the nation of Israel. We cannot then say, well, that wasn't the case with uh, Germany, that that was all Satan. As I said, Christians would be hypocrites to try and take that stance. However, it doesn't mean that there's more at play and more things we need to know about God and His character and how He works than just what uh, we find in the Old Testament examples of God coming against the nation of Israel. For Scripture gives us uh, uh, many other sides to the story, and we need to look at all the sides of the story if we are to have a, a proper understanding of how God works. And so I'm going to be looking at, uh, uh, at things, I believe, at examples of how God works that perhaps some Christians and certainly atheists are unaware of. So. Who was at work, or how was God at work? How much input did God have when it came to the Holocaust? And as Noplum 99 points out, if Hitler was actually acting on behalf of God and he was doing God's bidding, how can we then find him guilty? How can we condemn Hitler for doing only what God wanted of him? And how can God himself condemn Hitler? If Hitler was simply doing what God ordained, what God wanted, how can God possibly condemn him for it? So these are some of the questions that uh, 
uh, no plum either asked directly or implied or we know that this is really the gist of his video. So that's what I'm going to be looking at. Now the first thing I like to point out is that when I present the arguments it's going to sound like I may be presenting three or four different arguments for the Holocaust and uh, God's hand in it. But in fact everything I'm going to be presenting is true. All of these things are at work. And so I hope you will take that into consideration if you decide to leave comments or make a video response. It's not that there's only one particular explanation. There are actually a number of them. And even though on the outset or on the face they may seem to contradict one another, the truth is they don't. So, what about the Holocaust? Who was responsible? Was it God? Was it Satan? Was it God allowing Satan? Was it God simply removing his hand and uh, allowing the world to fall into disarray? These are the things I like to look at. First, I like to read from Ezekiel 34, beginning with verse 1. Then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds, the leaders of Israel. Give them this message from the sovereign Lord. What sorrow awaits you shepherds who feed yourselves instead of your flocks? Shouldn't shepherds feed their sheep? You drink the milk, wear the wool, and butcher the best animals, but you let your flocks starve. You have not taken care of the weak. You have not tended the sick or bound up the injured. You have not gone looking for those who have wandered away and are lost. Instead, you have ruled them with harshness and cruelty. So my sheep have been scattered without a shepherd, and they are easy prey for any wild animal. They have wandered through the mountains and all the hills across the face of the earth, yet no one has gone to search for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, says the Sovereign Lord, you abandoned my flock and left them to be attacked by every wild animal. And though you were my shepherds, you didn't search for my sheep when they were lost. You took care of yourselves and left the sheep to starve. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I now consider these shepherds my enemies, and I will hold them responsible for what has happened to my flock. I will take away their right to feed the flock, and I will stop them from feeding themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths. The sheep will no longer be their prey. Now, this could be applied, I guess, to almost any time in the history of the nation of Israel. For there are different times in their history when we see this kind of thing happening. That those people appointed to watch over the flock of Israel... Uh, they aren't doing their job, and God condemns them for it. So when bad things happen to the nation of Israel, the one that God is holding responsible are the leaders, those people he put in charge. Well, that's certainly the case uh, during the time leading up to World War II. There were leaders, there were shepherds who were given the responsibility of looking after the nation of Israel, looking after his people. But they did a lousy job. And so, bad things happened to the Israelites. Bad things happened to the Jews. But, as God explains, it wasn't his doing. It wasn't even the people who were doing the bad things to them that he is holding responsible here, but rather the leaders of the nation of Israel. So this is one reason of why the things happen. It has to do with the leadership, the shepherds, if you will, of the Jews. Now, I'm going to read from Enoch, First Enoch. And this is from chapter 89. I'm reading from this book here. Uh, chapter 89. This is actually a a vision or a dream that Enoch has and he's telling about the prophecy that he sees. It's actually a very long one. Uh, I just wish more people would take the time to read it, but 
It's important here what he has to say also about shepherds, for it goes even further than what we just heard from Ezekiel uh, explaining things. Uh, beginning with verse 57. And he called seventy shepherds and gave those sheep to them that they might pasture them. And he spoke to the shepherds and their companions. Understand this, when he's saying to the shepherds and their companions, uh, he's talking not only of Jewish leaders, but pagan and, and Gentile leaders as well. People such as uh, king, uh, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus. For they also were shepherds. And he called, I'm going to read this again. And he called 70 shepherds and gave those sheep to them that they might pasture them. And he spoke to the shepherds and their companions. Let each individual of you pasture the sheep from now on. And everything that I shall command you, that do you. And I will deliver them over to you duly numbered. And tell you of which of them are to be destroyed, and them you will destroy. And he gave over to them those sheep. Here, it's explaining that some of the sheep, some of the people of the nation of Israel, are going to be handed over to the shepherds to be destroyed. Well, that sounds pretty cruel, uh, immoral, unethical. Uh, a lot of people would say so, but let's continue reading. And he called another and spoke to him. Observe and mark everything that the shepherds will do to those sheep, for they will destroy more of them than I have commanded them. And every excess and the destruction which will be done through the shepherds record how many they destroy according to my command, and how many according to their own caprice record against every individual shepherd all the destruction he effects. And read out before me by number how many they destroy, and how many they deliver over for destruction, that I may have this as a testimony against them, and know every deed of the shepherds, that I may comprehend and see what to do, whether or not they abide my command which I have commanded them. But they shall not know it, and you shall not declare it to them, nor admonish them, but only record against each against each individual all the destruction which the shepherds effect, effect each in his time and lay it all before me. And I saw until those shepherds pastured in their season and they began to slay and to destroy more than they were bidden and they delivered those sheep into the hand of the lions and the lions and tigers ate and devoured the greater part of those sheep and the wild boars ate along with them and they burned that tower and demolished that house. And I became very sorrowful over that tower because that house of the sheep was demolished and afterwards I was unable to see if those sheep entered that house. And the shepherds and their associates delivered over those sheep to all the wild beasts to devour them. And each one of them received in his time a definite number. It was written by the other in a book how many each one of them destroyed of them. And each one slew and destroyed many more than was prescribed. And I began to weep and lament on account of those sheep. So here we see a very different story than what most are aware of in Scripture. Now a lot of people know that uh, the story of uh, King Saul where he was told to go out and destroy the Amorites completely but he didn't. He allowed the king to live and some of the animals that he said he was going to sacrifice to God and God became very angry. He gave instructions and there were people who were allowed to live that weren't supposed to. Now from what I just read, we see the very opposite, that God gives direction to certain shepherds that they are supposed to destroy X amount of sheep, but then they destroy many more than what they were supposed to. And so sometimes what we see happening in the case of uh, the Holocaust, for example, God says such and such is supposed to happen. But the one that he puts in charge, that shepherd, goes outside of what he was supposed to do. He decides to go further than the line that God 
had drawn. Now, is this the case with the Holocaust? Well, I certainly believe so. We have this example of it described in this prophecy by Enoch. Now, the shepherds he's talking about are people like Babylon, uh, Rome, uh, Hitler. These shepherds who were told to, to go and destroy a certain number and yet went beyond what they were supposed to do. So, can God be held accountable for this? Well, some would say God still allowed it, but God does allow free will. He allows those people that he appoints for certain tasks to have some leeway. They can do what God commands, or they can do less, such as King Saul did, or they can do more, such as the examples given by Enoch in his writing. Now, he doesn't give specific examples. He doesn't give names of these shepherds, but he tells us if there are 70 from the time he has this vision. And I certainly believe that Hitler was one of these 70. So here we see a different side of God and an explanation of his character and how he does things that most Christians are unaware of. Very few Christians have ever heard this story, have ever heard this side of God and how he works. That's why it's so important to have all of God's Word and not just what you find in the Bible. So, from Ezekiel to Enoch, we see that God does appoint people to do certain things. He puts people in power, political positions, whether it be in kingship or uh, president of a country or, or whatever the case may be. But sometimes people go beyond what they're supposed to do. So this explains some of the Holocaust. Then if we go to prophecy, prophecy talked about in places such as Revelation, Daniel, uh, 2nd Ezra, uh, Joel, uh, Ezekiel, all kinds of books, we see that God does tell us that his wrath is going to be poured out onto the world in the end days. Now scripture also tells us that the world is handed over to the prince of darkness to Satan. We know that Satan, for a time being, for a season or two, is in charge of this world. In the book of Revelation, we are also told that God turns his back, and in other places in Scripture as well, that God will turn his back when his covenant is broken. And by turning his back, it allows bad things to happen. Bad things will happen, but it's not in these cases that God is causing it, but simply because his glory is taken out of the world, these things happen. And that's when God says he turns his back on the world or his back on someone, what he's doing is simply taking away his glory. And when his glory leaves, then evil runs rampant. And so this is another reason for why things happen uh, as they did in World War II. Because of the way the world was living, God removed his glory. And when he removed his glory, that essence of his self, then we see bad things happening. So there's all kinds of reasons why things happen as they did. Now, can God hold Hitler responsible for what he did? Certainly he can and will. If God ordained, as I mentioned here, that he was to go so far and no further, and yet he went further, then he will be held responsible. And God will be just in doing so. And the world will be just in condemning Hitler for the things he did. Now, what about from the Jews' point of view? Well, certainly they are, or they will have to be held responsible as well. There's no question that the Jews don't accept Christ as their Savior. They have turned their back on God. And so there's all kinds of prophecies, all kinds of warning about what will happen to the nation of Israel. And worse things are yet to happen, to come against the nation of Israel because of the way they are living, because they continue to reject God. All of these things are talked about in prophecy. All right, uh, I know there's other things I wanted to talk about. Uh, 
I'll simply save them as possibly a response to this video either uh, by way of someone making a video response or people responding in comments. Uh, till next time, peace and blessings.